All right, our next order of business is presentations, and the first one is uh, going to be Brian. Again, this is the uh, Rosenwald Memorial photo, and Brian, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board and our audience. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Mr. Chris Robertson here. He's a regional historian from Raleigh, and he is going to give us a, a short presentation on the Rosenwald schools, and then uh, I think, Mr. Chairman, you'll give an opportunity for any students to make comments, sure, and then well. we'll unveil the, uh, the plaque. Uh, good evening to the commissioners and to the good people of Burke County. Um, I appreciate being part of this year's celebration of National Education Week in Burke County. I read online that Burke County's public schools were recently recognized for having the highest graduation rate of any medium-sized school district in the entire state. As a former teacher myself, I know this is a tremendous accomplishment. Burke's teachers are clearly working hard every day to keep their students motivated, focused, and moving forward. Today, we'll also recognize a few great educators from the past whose stories can still inspire us today. And we'll look back at another great accomplishment here in Burke County, the construction of five public Rosenwald schools during the 1920s. Uh, before I begin, I understand we may have uh, some former Rosenwald students. If, if you are a former Rosenwald student or a family member, would you please stand? Thank you so much. I hope to meet every one of you after the meeting. And Chris, we're going to invite them if they want anybody after you get done to come to the mic. And if they got any words, of, they yes. sure come to the mic. So go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd also like to recognize a few people uh, here in Burke County who are committed to preserving the county's history. Um, Phyllis Wogan, curator of the History Museum, Dottie Irvin, former director of the Historic Burke Museum, uh, and Lori Johnston, uh, curator of the Morganton Library. I believe we'll also have with us to, to this evening Annie McDonald of the State Historic Preservation Office in Asheville. Uh, ladies, if you are here, please stand up. Okay, thank you. Let's give them a <laughs> Ladies, thank you for your contributions to this project as well. Only one of Burke's five Rosenwald schools still stands. I want to thank the men and women of the Corpening Chapel and the Bridgewater Elks Lodge as they have been the caretakers of that historic property for many years. I thank the commissioners for their invitation today. Without their interest in Burke's local history, I would not be here. My presentation today will be short. If anyone has any questions or comments, my email will appear at the end on the screen, and I welcome you to contact me. In recent years, I've enjoyed several visits here while researching my own family's history. My ancestors arrived here in 1777, which I believe was the year that the county was organized, and they remained in this county until 1904. Uh, as I researched my own ancestors in Bridgewater in western Burke County, I became aware of the neighboring African-American family of John and Martha Rutherford Corpening, a family that donated land for both a church and a school. Of that family, Bessie Pearl Corpening would become principal of the school, which still stands in Bridgewater, and Pinckney Corpening would lead the respected Olive Hill High School of Morganton. As I learned more about that family, I realized that they had helped pioneer Burke's early African-American education for over 25 years. Both Bessie and Pinckney Corpening had worked in Rosenwald schools, so I began to learn more about the Rosenwald movement and its legacy here in Burke County. I found that some research had been done on Burke's African-American schools, but Burke's Rosenwald history had not been researched. I decided that I might help to recover that missing chapter. Today, I'll focus more on the last existing Rosenwald School in Bridgewater. The history of the other four Rosenwald schools are now being compiled by the museum and the library. They're asking anyone with information or photos on those schools to please contact the North Carolina room of the Morganton Public Library. This is our introduction to Ms. Bessie Corbin. We'll, uh, we'll learn more about her in a few minutes. These are the five Rosenwald schools of Burke County, North Carolina. Uh, there are different names associated with each school. Uh, for example, the first one was named Canal School during its Rosenwald application. Uh, it was called Rosenwald School in the directories uh, of North Carolina education, uh, but it was informally known in Bridgewater and still is today as the first Corpening School. 
Uh, the Morganton School would later be known as Olive Hill. Meckleroth's Chapel would become, would, would merge into McAlpine. And then there was the Rock Hill School and the Willow Tree School. To appreciate the importance of the Rosenwald schools, we need to quickly revisit the Jim Crow era, when the southern states were busy legalizing segregation for all public facilities. Their goal at that time was simple, separate the races. Even though many facilities were already separated by social custom, it must have been very discouraging for African Americans to find their status was actually being written into state law. So as North Carolina's state-funded public education began in the early 1900s, so did segregation laws of every kind. You see here, 1875, white and black children shall be taught in separate public schools, but there shall be no discrimination made in favor of or to the prejudice of either race. This was the legal doctrine of separate but equal. I'm pretty sure when they passed that, they knew that separate would not be equal. Uh, in 1896, the U.S. Supreme Court pretty much uh, uh, rubber stamped the southern states' uh, segregation laws, giving them the green flag to proceed and write yet more segregation laws. And it wasn't just the schools. Uh, aside from accommodations, hotels, theaters, uh, buses, mental hospitals, the North Carolina State Libraries, prisons, even cemeteries had legalized segregation. As you can see, the entire state of North Carolina was being legally segregated, every county by state law. For some Americans, the early 1900s was an optimistic, progressive, prosperous era with growing opportunities. But for many African Americans, this was a gloomy period, with segregation laws limiting every aspect of their public lives, worst of all, the education of their children. With minimal resources, pioneering African American educators like Burks, Bessie, and Pinckney Corpeting had to somehow provide students with knowledge that would help them move forward. Just as important, they also had to keep their students motivated hopeful that despite all the legal segregation, their lives might one day get better. So as the Rosenwald movement began, how was separate but equal working out for the education of North Carolina's African-American children? Not well. In the first decade of the 1900s, one in five, 20 percent, white North Carolinians grew to adulthood without learning to read. For the state's African-Americans, the rate was one in two, 50 percent. So in the 1920s, African-American illiteracy was a serious problem in North Carolina and throughout the South. Fortunately, two strong-willed leaders decided to tackle this problem. Born a slave in Virginia, Dr. Booker T. Washington would become the most prominent African-American leader between 1890 and 1915. He had worked his way through Hampton Institute in Virginia and became the first leader of the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. His popular autobiography, Up From Slavery, covered 40 years of his life from slave to schoolmaster to national leader. He attributed his success to a decent education, hard work, and good relationships. He believed that education was the best way to improve the lives of African Americans and the best way to gradually improve racial relations in the South. Fortunately for the South, Dr. Washington's book was read by, name, by a man named Julius Rosenwald. As president of Sears in Chicago, Julius Rosenwald had become one of America's wealthiest men. He observed the hardships endured by Southern African Americans and decided he would use his fortune to improve their education. During the summer of 1910, Mr. Rosenwald read Dr. Washington's book, Up From Slavery. The next year, the two men met, and in 1912, Mr. Rosenwald donated a gift to Tuskegee for use in higher education. Dr. Washington asked if a small portion of that gift could be used to build several public elementary schools in rural Alabama. Mr. Rosenwald was so impressed with the result that he and Dr. Washington continued their building of schools. In 1915, Dr. Washington died, but his ideas had made a lasting impression on Mr. Rosenwald. Two years later, Rosenwald announced that he would expand the program he and Washington had begun throughout the South. Architects at Tuskegee created many different designs for state-of-the-art rural schools. Counties could choose among those designs to suit their budgets and needs. Burke County chose several different designs for its Rosenwald schools. How do we measure the success of the Rosenwald movement? Well, between 1917 and 1932, over 5,300 Rosenwald buildings were built in 15 states. Of that number, 813 were built in North Carolina, more than in any other state. Look at this map. Every dot was a new school. 
Researchers at the University of Chicago found that the Rosenwald program accounted for impressive gains in literacy among Southern African Americans. Among former Rosenwald students, they found significant improvements in school attendance, years of schooling, and cognitive test scores. The Rosenwald movement was a great success, accelerating the pace of improvements in African American education throughout the South, in North Carolina, and in Burke County. In 1891, in Burke County, the Morganton Graded School for Colored Children was operating on West Concord Street. In 1902, the North Carolina General Assembly passed a law requiring all county school boards to provide all children between 8 and 16 with at least 16 weeks of education annually. This means that Burke County was educating at least some of its African-American children 11 years before it was required to do so by state law. In 1905, according to local school board records, Burke had 290 African-American students. At that time, the county had eight log schools for white children and five log schools for African-American children. So African-American schools were built early in Burke County, but the quality of those schools was lacking. When the opportunity to upgrade came through the Rosenwald Fund, Burke County jumped on board. With five new public schools built, Burke became a full participant in the Rosenwald movement. These were the Rosenwald schools of Burke County. This school, the Rosenwald application name was Morganton School. It would become known as Olive Hill High School, built in 1923, 1924. This was the largest of Burke's Rosenwald schools. Uh, these photos you see are the original photos before any, moder uh, before any modifications were made to the buildings. This photo, taken about 1929, is of the Olive Hill High School baseball team. On the far left is Principal Pinckney Corpeting who led Olive Hill School for 19 years, from 1921 until his death in 1940. On the far right, you can see Coach Joseph Arnold. McElrath's Chapel would merge into McAlpine School. Willow Tree School, built in 1925-26, and Rock Hill School, built the following year. And now we finally come to the last Rosenwald School to still stand in Burke County. This building, built in Bridgewater, was known during construction as the Canal School. After construction, it was officially known in educational directories as Rosenwall School. In Bridgewater, it is still known as the first Corpeting School, not to be confused with the Corpeting School that was later built on Piney Road. Uh, that building is now known as the Heartland Community Center. And here again, we see Ms. Bessie Corpeting, the teacher and principal of the school in Bridgewater. She was born in 1894. She graduated from St. Augustine's College, which still operates in Raleigh today. The Rosenwald Building in Bridgewater was built in 1926. So this year, 2016, marks the historic building's 90th anniversary. It appears, however, that the Corpeting School may be about 10 years older. Uh, according to folks in Bridgewater, Ms. Corpeting started teaching out of the chapel in 1916. Uh, if Bessie was operating a school out of the chapel in 1916, then this year, 2016, marks the 100th year anniversary of the original Corpening School. Bessie taught in Western Burke County for more than 30 years. She lived to age 98 and passed away in 1992. Here we can see Bessie Corpening when she was younger. She's standing in front of the family's home. She's wearing the light-colored dress. Uh, seated are her, in the middle are her parents, John and Martha Rutherford Corpening. Uh, before the Civil War, war uh, John Corpening had been a slave. After the war, he and Martha acquired 120 acres on the river. They had a large family and a successful home. They donated land for the Corpening AME Chapel in 1916. That church is still active today. The Corpening family also donated land for the school. The old Corpening home still stands, but is vacant and thought to be unstable. Here are just a few pictures of the school that were taken a couple of years ago. Finally, in 1954, in a unanimous decision for the case Brown versus Board of Education, the United States Supreme Court struck down its earlier decision. They declared, separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. School segregation is unconstitutional and must end with all deliberate speed. Of course, some Southern leaders delayed the process, but they would ultimately fail. 
the court had delivered a fatal blow to the separate but equal doctrine. With no legal foundation, the segregation laws of North Carolina and many other southern states began to fall one after the other. During this National Education Week, we celebrate all of our schools. Today, Burke's integrated public schools provide quality education for all children. They also provide a setting in which children learn to understand and respect one another. In other words, they prepare students for the real world. Today, we honor the historic legacy of the Rosenwald Schools of Burke County. We honor the early African-American educators who worked very hard with minimal resources to improve literacy and to keep their students motivated during difficult times. We honor Burke's early community leaders and local officials as they worked together to successfully build five new schools, upgraded facilities that would serve Burke County for decades. Today, Burke joins counties across North Carolina that have officially recognized the Rosenwald schools to show how their counties chose to join an historic movement that improved millions of lives and their families and communities across the South. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, just before... Uh... Chris, uh, you already thanked some people, but there also uh, we want to thank a few other people, which is Fisk University, uh, Bruce McKesson, uh, G and G Art and Frame, Wise Cabinet Shop, and the county staff and others. And I, I don't know if everybody knows Brian went out there to get for this uh, frame. He went out to the school and took some uh, of the wood down there. And of course, a lot of it was rotten or whatever, so we had, had to have it planed and whatever. But again, we thank county staff and everybody. And uh, before the unveiling, uh, does anybody want to come from the audience and come up and speak on that was maybe a student there at the Rosenwald School? We have uh, somebody with us tonight, Coley, Whitworth, Coley Willie Whitworth, who's 86 years old, and uh, she went to school there. So if anybody wants to come forward, please come up and use the mic. And this is Coley coming up here, 86 years old, was a member of the Rosenwald School. So thank Bye. you. Go ahead. And Thank you for every one of you here tonight. So it's been a long time since I went to school, so I was born in 1939, and I went up there in 1945. So I went up there for five years, and then we moved to back out time for a while. So I had 10 other brothers and sisters went there for what I did. And I don't know which one they left, so I wasn't paid. I don't know which one's still here because it was a good school to teach from the first and eighth grade. But some of them graduated sad, some of them did. And just like I did, I didn't do that. But that's about all I remember now because I'm, I'm 77 years old myself. Good, thank you. <laughs> Can you get up to the mic a little, please, so we can all hear? I just thank the Lord that I'm able enough to, to be here to stand and witness with my brother Kenneth that we went both went to that school and Miss Betsy T. Copening was our teacher and she was just as sweet as she could be and I guess all the family because I didn't know nobody but her and. I enjoyed going while I was going. I didn't go too long, but yet and still, I thank the Lord to be here to recognize this, her service that she did while she was in our county. Good, thank you. And I just thank the Lord that he just keeps on teaching on. <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> anybody, anybody else would like to say a few words? And again, would all the people from the Rosenwald School please stand up to all the ones that went to the Rosenwald? And let's give them a big round of applause. All right, we're going to unveil this. I'm going to ask the commissioners to all come down here. I think this is a, a great thing. And let's all the commissioners, Jay, I'll let's all come down here for the unveiling.
we didn't trust to go to the fire station to the museum. And I had a public list, thank you. And thank you in the letter earlier. But I want to publicly thank you. We're having a fundraiser. You can give us money if you want to. That's not the reason we're here. Thursday night, between 5 and 7, we're having a fundraising chicken dinner. Five, and it'll be 30. And I would like to invite two of you and Chris, if you're safe, and your spouse to come as our guests for a chicken dinner to see the old annex. We call it now the museum annex. So you're invited to come. Thank you very much.